I used to do that, you know. Every day, twice a day, at rush hour. I don't have to do it anymore, thank goodness. Well, after all, I have been doing it for 50 years, barring weekends and holidays. But London transport means a lot more to me than standing on a crowded platform waiting for a train. You see, I used to work for it. And in a sort of way, I loved it. I loved the variety of it all. That feeling that every day we were moving millions of people about in different ways all over that vast area, making it easier for them to get on with their work and their lives. And I can't help loving it still. Well, why else, now that I'm retired, would I want to explore all those parts that I've never had the chance to see before? Of course, I remember what transport in London used to be like. No proper system, cutthroat competition between rivals, stealing each other's customers. Well, that's how it was when I was a schoolboy. In 1933, somebody did something about it and formed London Transport as we know it now. And that was the year I joined the firm. The chairman, Lord Ashfield, with his deputy, Frank Pick, felt that now the whole system, all 2,000 square miles of it, was all of a piece, it ought to look all of a piece. All the parts should have the same sort of style. I reckon it was that special lettering they used more than anything else that made you feel you were in good hands. London Transport's familiar look gave us all the feeling of belonging to the same big city. They had a lot of grand plans for improvement and expansion, as you might imagine. But before most of them could get underway, the Second World War broke out and all the new schemes got knocked on the head. Londoners were sheltering from the bombs down in the underground. Up above, London itself was taking a terrible battle. had to get on with it. There was no choice. I think it was just the will to keep going from day to day that pulled us through. When peace came in 1945, we were left with a battered city and a worn out transport system. It still seemed something left over from a distant past. But we soon started putting it right. First of all, out came those delayed plans for the extensions to the central line, both east and west. They were the first things we really saw. Look, there's the chairman on the left, riding on the first train. And look, there's me. In 1951, after all those drab years of war, we gave ourselves a boost. We celebrated the Festival of Britain. It was really to cheer us all up a bit, and it did. People came from all over the place to the south bank of the Thames to see the wonders of the exhibition. London transport had to cope. 
special needs for special events. All Londoners have a soft spot for their city and particularly its past. We all shed a bit of a tear in 1952 when the last of the old trams went. London, especially south of the river, would never look the same again. Nor sound the same. I suppose it's called progress. And now, more than 30 years later, we're almost back to trams with a light, rapid transit for Docklands. We'll never forget the tram. We owe Londoners. The new bus which replaced the trams and the pre-war buses which still struggled on was called the RT. And it became the standard bus for the whole fleet. And very nice looking it was too. It even had its own overhaul works at Aldenham. There a bus could be stripped down, the parts checked, cleaned or replaced and the whole lot put together as a new bus. Soon it was ready for another three or four years out on the road. The big idea in those days was to get people and industries away from overcrowded London. We heard a lot about these new towns. They built them in the country, usually not too far from London, and LT had to set about providing transport for them in the new towns themselves and the places nearby. And green lines linking the new towns with older towns around, as well as with London itself. London's country's a lot nearer than you might think. It became even nearer still with the final electrification of the Metropolitan Line. Fast new electric trains were whizzing along where once old steam locos had chugged in and out of Metroland. Do you remember the trolley bus gliding silently across between a tram and a bus? Wheels freed from tracks, but the power still coming from overhead wires. In the 30s, they ousted the trams in North London, and in the 60s, they got ousted themselves. The old trolley buses and the old buses were gradually replaced by the route master. A sturdy new bus with only one thing going against it. The increase in London's traffic. Let's stop. The only stop. These were the years when the problems started building up. The problems of any big city. It began to seem like rush hour all day. There's an empty bus right behind me as well. So they were also the years when we had to learn to solve those problems and cope with all this pressure. To help a bus keep on schedule, there was an experiment called BESI. It stood for the Bus Electronic Scanning Indicator. An electronic eye at the top of a column told the control room where the bus was. On some services, the controller was in radio contact with the driver. Heavy traffic. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Over and out. He's running four minutes late. Today we have Busco, Bus Control. It does a better and quicker job with an up-to-date display unit. A microcomputer on the bus reports its position to the control room. Advice to the driver comes up on a panel in his cab, and all in a matter of seconds. Another idea was to have special traffic lanes in busy streets for buses only.
The Red Arrow bus is also started as an experiment from mainline stations to the shopping centres and busiest areas. Next stop, Victoria. London has got rather fond of them. Experimental, too, were the new trains. They were aluminium, which meant they saved weight and therefore saved power. And they saved paint. Closed circuit television was another innovation. It's used to observe passenger movements on crowded platforms at rush hour. Now, really big news. The first new tunnelling in London for 20 years, the long-planned Victoria Line, linking many mainline stations with changeover points to all the other lines on the underground. The name derives, of course, from the great-great-grandmother of our present queen. It soon became a favourite line. The trains were so frequent and so comfortable. It was what they call a long felt want. And soon we couldn't think how we managed without it. Up to the end of 1969, the whole LT system reported to the Ministry of Transport. A new act then came into effect, passing much of the control to the Greater London Council. We lost the Green Line in the country area, but we kept the red buses and the whole of the underground. Sooner or later, the jet age which had changed the world was going to change our transport. And LT did a lot of replanning. The Piccadilly line was driven right into the centre of Heathrow, the busiest airport in Europe, straight from the very centre of London, linking Piccadilly Circus with a jumbo jet. But there's also a choice, an Airbus. Express most of the way, also coming right to the heart of London. This is just the thing if you're weighed down with a lot of luggage. In 1979, the Jubilee line was opened. It incorporated part of the old Bakerloo in North London and went to a whole new complex at Charing Cross. You know, in all these years, our ideas of the link between transport and the city have changed. First, all that happened was to put buses on the roads and trains under them to help people to go the way they were going already. And then it was found that the transport itself actually changed people's movements. Places became busier because they were easier to get to. People went to live further out in the country because the transport went there. And in my 50 years at LT, I've seen how transport has had to adjust. The changes in how and where people live and the hours that they work. And other challenges, like more use of the motor car. In the very official wording of the Transport Act, it says, the duty of the executive is to perform their functions to provide public passenger services as best meet the needs for the time being of Greater London. Well now, that seems to me to be the clue. For the time being.
In other words, London transport has got to keep changing just as the life in London keeps changing. And that's the way to keep moving London. <laughs>